So John chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. And this is the great passage where Jesus teaches Nicodemus about the necessity of being born again, or the necessity of being born from above. And so we begin reading at verse 1. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, We know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, No one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit." How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. God's word to us. And so our passage for this morning is, as I've said, that great teaching from Jesus on the necessity of being born again. What we're going to focus on this morning is actually just two verses in this passage. I'm sure you can guess which ones. It's verse 14 and verse 15, which D.A. Carson, in his great commentary on the book of John, says that those verses serve as the frankest answer to Nicodemus' question in verse 9. How can this be? And so our main lesson then for this morning from this passage, from those verses, is this. Just as the Israelites looked to the bronze snake and lived, so all who look to the lifted up and glorified Christ by faith will have eternal life. A powerful truth to reflect on. Just before I dive into those two passages, those two verses, however, I do want to add one thing on, verse, on John 3.16. So verse 16 of this passage. Many of you have heard me joke time and time again that the three rules of proper Bible interpretation are context, context, context. The importance of reading a passage in its context. Certainly its historical context, when it was written, who by, all those kinds of things. But also the literary context, the context in which the verse is placed within the passage. 
John 3.16, as I know many of you know, is one of those verses that almost everyone knows. Certainly every Christian probably knows this verse, and I would be willing to bet that even many non-Christians know the verse or would at least be able to recognize the verse if they heard it. And certainly it is a beautiful verse. It is a verse that sums up the beauty and the clear teaching of the gospel message in one little verse. That out of great love, God sent his only begotten son, Jesus, and that whoever believes, responds to this good news, believes in Jesus, has eternal life. Will not perish, but have eternal life. And we want to praise God for that truth and for this verse, as it's a great verse to memorize, to know this gospel deep down within us. But to get back to the context thing, I hope that you also caught what comes right after this verse. That this verse, yes, speaks about love and the good news of the gospel, but it also touches on condemnation. So it touches on both salvation and condemnation. As we've seen in verse 18, it goes on to say, if we continue reading from John 3.16, verse 18 says, Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. And so you see that this passage touches on both salvation and condemnation. And we need to remember this. And we also need to remember what makes the difference. What makes the difference between salvation and condemnation is belief or faith in the Son of God. And so we need to believe this good news. So that's my few little additional points on John 3.16. Now back to verses 14 and 15. And so just to remind you, it says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life. And so then, our passage, as I've said, is that great teaching by Jesus to Nicodemus about how we must be born again. Jesus says to Nicodemus, Very truly I tell you that no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Nicodemus naturally is confused, as I think you and I would be as well. And he says, How can someone be born when they are old? Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. And so Jesus clarifies that what he is talking about is not a fleshly birth, but a spiritual one. Being born of water and the Spirit. And how this is a great act of God. A great act of God the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 14 and 15, as I've already quoted from D.A. Carson, those verses serve as the frankest answer to Nicodemus' question in verse 9 when he says, How can this be? Speaking there certainly of being born again, but also all of these things that Jesus is teaching on in this passage. And so this frank answer that is given is that like Moses lifted up the snake in the Old Testament to heal and to save the Israelites bitten by the snake, so the Son of Man, and that's Jesus, must be lifted up. And all who believe in him, the result will be eternal life. To quote Carson at full here, he says this, Here then is the frankest answer to Nicodemus' question, How can this happen? The kingdom of God is seen or entered, new birth is experienced, and eternal life begins through the saving cross work of Christ, received by faith. That's a powerful passage. Reflect on that for a second with me. That the kingdom of God is seen or entered, that the new birth is experienced, and eternal life begins through the saving cross work of of Jesus Christ, received by faith. That is an amazing truth of this passage, that it's through Jesus being lifted up on the cross and all that that means, and then us receiving that by faith, that we have these things, that we enter the kingdom of God, that the new birth is experienced, and that eternal life begins. And so then... A few words are worth being, uh, additional words are worth being pointed out here about this term, lifted up. Lifted up. As some of you probably may have seen if you have your Bible with you, 
by the word lifted up, there's a little footnote, at least in the NIV there is, that says the Greek for lifted up also means exalted. And so the idea of being lifted up also has with it the idea of being exalted. And so this term actually appears a number of times in John's gospel. And so it has a certain sense of meaning here. And I want to offer a few quotations from D.A. Carson to help us to grasp the point that this passage is trying to make. Because it's a bit more of a subtler point than the point that I just made a moment ago. And so Carson points out that this word always combines the notion of being physically lifted up on the cross with the notion of exaltation. Of being exalted, of course, that means. And so he goes on to say, John makes it clear that Jesus' return to the glory that he had with the Father before the world began is accomplished by being lifted up on the cross. And so it's through this suffering that there is glorification of the Son. And anyone here who's been at the Bible study on 1 Peter, little flags should be popping up in your brain when we hear this, that suffering and glory, suffering then glory. He goes on to say, Jesus is the sufferer and the exalted one. But it transpires that it's precisely in the matrix of suffering and exaltation that God most clearly reveals himself in the person of his son. One final quote here to hopefully we'll grasp this point. In the fourth gospel, these themes, that of divine revelation, because uh, D.A. Carson has, has made some points on that, but for our purposes, specifically exaltation and the obedient suffering of the Son, constantly congregate around the title Son of Man. And notice the words that are in this passage here. It also says that he must be lifted up. That is the determined purpose of God. The word must is a strong word that we don't want to miss. The Son of Man must be lifted up. And that is the determined purpose of God, as Carson says. And finally, he says this. By his being lifted up, Jesus, the Son of Man, will be returned to the glory that he once shared with his Father. While those who turn to him, as the Israelites turn to the bronze snake, will experience new birth. And so let's put this all together then. How is the kingdom seen or entered? How is one born again? How does eternal life begin? The answer is that it's only through the death of Christ received by faith. And the result of that is eternal life. And all of this is from the great love of God. It finds its source in the love of God. For God so loved the world. And Jesus returns to the glory that he had with his Father in and through his suffering on the cross. And so there are two lessons I want to draw out to leave you with this morning. The first is this. Believe this good news. Look to Christ, the one who was lifted up on the cross. So just as in the Old Testament, those who looked at the bronze snake were healed, so all who look to Christ by faith are born from above. They have salvation, which means they will not perish, but have eternal life. And I hope that you see just how amazing those truths are. And I just wanted to read one passage to help you to grasp what eternal life with Christ means. And so Revelation chapter 21 verses 1 to 4 have these beautiful words that describe what it will be like to spend eternity with our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. It says this in Revelation 21 beginning at verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And these beautiful words here that I struggle to read without tears. He will wipe every tear from their eye. There will be no more death, no more mourning, crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away.
That should warm our hearts, reflect on those truths. No more crying, no more tears, no more pain. That is why everyone who is in Christ by faith, everyone who looks to this lifted up Jesus has in store for them. Beautiful, beautiful truths. That's the first lesson. The second lesson is this, and it touches on the more subtle point that is brought out in this passage by the quotes I did from D.A. Carson. And it's this idea of suffering and glory, that Jesus is glorified in and through his suffering. That Jesus is glorified in and through his suffering. And so for those of us studying together from 1 Peter, we've seen this truth over and over again that Christ is our example of how to suffer. And it is through and in suffering that there is exaltation and glory. And Christ is our great example of this. In 1 Peter, if you have your Bible, you could jump over with me to 1 Peter. In 1 Peter chapter 4, we find these words where Peter says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the firing, fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. And the point, certainly one point we can draw from that, is that suffering is part of this life. Suffering is part of this fallen experience that we find ourselves in. But yet we know that as we look to Christ, that, there's, that he is glorified in and through suffering, that these truths are true for us as well. That one day, even though we suffer in this life, one day we will be raised with Christ as he was raised. And we know too that God can redeem the suffering that we experience, which of course we ultimately see in Christ. But think about in our own lives, God can take our suffering and he can use it certainly for our good. He can use it certainly for, our, for his glory as well. And as many people shared, or some people shared at the Bible study, think of how God has taken you through suffering in your life so that at some time in the future, perhaps, you can then come alongside someone else and help them with what they experience. And so God can take our suffering and he can use it for good. And certainly that is the truth of Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, that all things work together for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purposes. Which, as I always say, does not mean that all those things are good. They're, they're difficult, they're, they're true. To go through cancer in this life, to go through suffering, to lose a loved one, etc., etc., the list could go on, is hard and difficult. But we believe that God can redeem that for his purposes and ultimately for his glory. And I want to leave you with a few quotations from an excellent little video by John Piper, where he's talking about the prosperity gospel and how it's not true. But in the context of this brief little video, he also touches on the topic of suffering. And he says that, more or less makes the point that how we bear up under suffering can bring glory to God if we bear up well. He says that if, through the deepest possible pain, we say that God is enough, that he is good, that he will satisfy us, that he will get us through this, that God is glorified in that. Then he goes on to quote uh, from the Psalms that says, He is our treasure. Whom have I in heaven but you? And on earth is there nothing I desire but you? My flesh and my heart may fail, but you are my portion forever. That makes God look glorious. And then he goes on to say boldly that he prays that the Christian church will be marked by suffering for Christ and that God is most glorified in you when you are most satisfied in him in the midst of loss, in the midst of pain and suffering, not prosperity. And so I ask us all to reflect, how do you suffer? How do you face the suffering that you go through in this life? And I would encourage all of us to look to Christ as our example of how to suffer. And know that our suffering can be used by God for our good, for the good of others, and for the glory of God. And so then, to answer Nicodemus's question, how can this be? How can one be born again? How does one enter and see the kingdom? The answer is the cross work of Christ received by faith. And so just like the Israelites looked at the bronze snake and were healed, so all those who look to Christ and the one who was lifted up on the cross, Christ was that one that was lifted up. He was lifted up for our sins and he was raised to life for our justification. If we look to him, we have life eternal. And so look to him and never ever stop looking to him your whole life long. Look to him as the one and only Savior and also 
as our example of how to suffer. And know that one day we will be with him and there will be no more tears or crying or pain. Praise our great God and our, his Savior, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we're so thankful for these truths. We're so thankful that if we look to Christ, the one who is indeed high and lifted up, but the one who was high and lifted up on a cross for us, that in him we find the salvation of our souls. And in him we also find the example of how to suffer, that suffering and that there's glory in and through suffering, and that you can use our suffering and our pain for our good and for your glory. We trust you with these things, and we pray all of these things through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.